Today brings us to the conclusion of our little series of Side by Side through Proverbs with Jesus' help. And it's been a, an interesting journey and I hope you find it helpful. And I would just recommend that you go reading your way through Proverbs more slowly. As you know from chapters 10 to 31, we've really just taken the main themes rather than going through individual Proverbs, which would have taken us, well, quite a long time. So today we come to our final thought, and it is about the question of life and death. Proverbs helps remove the confusion that exists in our world. The confusion about right and wrong categories that people, I think, have become really deciding for themselves. If it's okay for me, it's okay for me. If it's okay for you, it's okay for you. You don't need to judge me. I don't need to judge you. We just do pretty much what we think is right. And that's a sort of a, the way our world has become. Consequences are another gray area. Some people want to be able to live however they want and to avoid any unpleasant consequence. We live in a sort of a, a therapeutic society where every bad outcome is going to be tried, try to remove it in some way. And perhaps like making it possible to place your hand in the flames, but not get it burned. Now, even using that statement, you and I know that's impossible. But that's the sort of illusion that people live with today, that I can live as I want and avoid the consequences, or somebody will step in to minimize or to remove the consequences that I don't want. And yet, the fact remains that this is a moral universe. And just as in the physical realm, where there is a real law of gravity that anchors us upon the earth, thankfully, so too there is a spiritual dimension where moral law exists. Because our Creator, the Lord above who made all things, including us, is a moral God. He is a God who has laid down a moral law to govern the hearts and minds of humans, just as there's physical laws that govern the various activities of the physical realm. And the main storyline of Scripture, which is creation, followed by fall, leading to redemption through Christ on the cross, and then continuing on to glory, which we haven't yet achieved, but is what God is planning for his new creation. That storyline of Scripture is an unchanging story. And it's the one within which everybody's life lives. And you cannot avoid it. I mean, you can't live outside this universe. And you can pretend it's a different universe than it really is. But that's the one in which all our decisions take place. And there will be consequences. Not just short-term ones, as when we tell a lie and then it catches us up and shames us and maybe we pay for it. But long-term, eternal consequences exist. And it's Proverbs that speaks so much more about these and offers us a way forward that Jesus died to make possible. Take, for example, this truth, that the word life and live occur 56 times in Proverbs and the word death and die 20 times which makes these two a kind of core theme in Proverbs. Sometimes it's the word path or way or the word road that is used to describe them. For example, Proverbs 14.12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Or again, take Proverbs 12.28. A different perspective says, In the path of righteousness, is life, and it, in its pathway there is no death. Proverbs is a realistic look at life, and so you cannot look at life realistically and not face up to the facts of life and death. Jesus himself uses similar metaphors when he speaks of the broad and the narrow road. He says there is a broad way that leads to destruction and a narrow road that leads to life. And he faces us here in saying so, in Matthew 7 there, with choices and consequences. So if we're thinking about in the path of righteousness is life, what is that saying? Because that seems to be key to understanding. So what then is righteousness? In the Bible, the word righteousness is used to describe, for example, a set of accurate weights. So that if they weigh correctly, 
they're called righteous. It's a bit like if you have a 12-inch ruler that is an accurate 12 inches and there's nothing inaccurate, it could be described as a righteous ruler. Or equally, if you had a thermometer that was, way, that was measuring temperature perfectly, it could be called a righteous thermometer. Now, there's an outside standard to all of those things, isn't there, that you measure it against or it's been decided this measurement is the accurate one. Somebody somewhere has decided that. It reminds me of the man and the story which I've told a number of times, but I tell here because it's helpful. The man who, on his way every day to the factory, has a look in the, the, the window of the watchmaker, adjusts his clock and heads off to the factory. He does this days upon end, with the watchmaker, of course, becoming more and more intrigued as to why he does it. One day, this man comes into the watchmaker's shop and asks him if he would repair or check or service his watch. The man has the courage and says to him, Excuse me, sir, could you tell me why it is that every day you come and you seem to look at my clock and I don't, what are you doing? What's that about? Oh, he said, I'm the man who's responsible in the factory for setting the whistle time for the break times to make sure it's accurate. So I come here to get the correct time from your clock. Ah, the watchmaker then said, Well, that's a bit of a problem, he says, because I set my clock from your whistle. You see, if we keep just making up our moral decisions and our moral authority from each other, oh, it's all right with me and it's all right with you, then it's all right. We need an outside authority and that outside authority is God who's given us in his truth and put his conscience written hardwired upon our minds. Of course, we can deny our conscience, we can ignore our conscience, we can harden our conscience. All those things do happen as people, when they do wrong, reject the wit, the, the wit and the acu accusation of conscience and don't respond with confession, repentance and turning to God for mercy. Now, the amazing thing is that Jesus knows all this and he knows the mess we're making of our lives. He knows the choices that we have made and, and continue to make based on our fallen nature. And he knows that we are duly, justly to be condemned. But he made a choice and his choice was to come to this earth and to live, and to do it in the way that it's recorded in Philippians, that he took upon himself the human nature, he became obedient, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And that's what Christ chose to do. He chose to offer himself as the substitute for us and our sin. And he looks at us, not with condemning eyes, no, for he looks at us with the eyes of a doctor who sees a sick patient. That's how he describes himself in Luke 5. It's not those who are well who need a doctor, but the sick. And I've come to call those who are sick to healing, to repentance and to forgiveness. You see, being all in with Jesus is the path to and life itself, the way. Less, sorry, Jesus calls himself the way. And maybe by saying that, he helps us see it. This a way that seems right to a man but ends in death. Jesus, he contrasts that and he says, but I am the way, the truth and the life. Trusting Jesus, opening up our lives to Jesus, following Jesus as he teaches us in the word, experiencing Jesus' forgiveness and applying and accepting his death for us are all part of this. Now, where are we in all of this? Have we trusted in the Lord Jesus? Are we constantly looking to him day by day as our way? Are we conscious of already experiencing the consequences of our own way? I think all of us are to some degree because it happens sometimes very quickly. When we choose our selfish way, it can produce all sorts of miserable consequences. And of course, one day we know that it will mean that we will be forever separated from love and grace and beauty and peace from God himself. Whereas Jesus the way and Jesus way leads us to life, forgiveness, love, contentment, blessing, hope and grace. You see, Jesus is the wisdom of God. And as we said at the start some weeks ago, and we remind ourselves again, if we've never opened up our lives to his mercy, that's what we need to do. We'll never be able to live Proverbs until we have the life of Christ in us. Jesus came in order that we might have life this good life that we read of in Proverbs. And what we need to do is to place ourselves in his hands 
trust him for cleansing our sinful hearts and thank him for that. And this might be just the first step on the path of life to life eternal. But this is a very important step. And today is a great opportunity. It's a moment. Let's not waste it, but let's grasp it. And if in any way I can help you in this choice and the decisions following, please do get in touch with me. It would be my joy to help you in that step.